Thank you. Do you know the men in grey? The guys who steal your time? I met them first when I was a child and read the story of Momo, written by Michael Ender. Momo is a little girl who lives alone in an old amphitheater. She is full of imagination and ideas, and she's a good listener. Every day, friends and neighbors are visiting her to play with her or just to tell her what's going on in their lives. But as time passes by, Momo realizes that the people around her have less and less time to visit her, as they are always working and in a hurry. It's the men in gray who steal their time and smoke it in tiny cigarettes, which again give them the power to live. Momo leaves her old amphitheater, only accompanied by a very, very old turtle called Cassiopeia, to fight against those men who are omnipresent for her, but invisible to most people. In the end, Momo conquers the time thieves and gives people back their time. They start to listen, pause, and live again. I was fascinated by this story, but didn't get the whole dimension back then. It became my favorite book anyhow, and three years ago, I found an until then unpublished interview with Michael Ender, who said that in order to really change something in our society, you would have to start with the children. That's why he decided to put his thoughts into children's books. I was really touched by that idea, but when I looked around in my now adult environment, I found that nothing had really changed since my childhood. In the company I was working for and in most companies around me, people were so stressed, almost always in a hurry, struggling to make life fit their work somehow. The toughest thing for me to realize was that even people my age started to save things for later. Not only money, which I found crazy enough, but also experiences, travels, and time. As if Momo had shown us that saving time is not possible. Because what should you save it for? For the men in grey to smoke it? For your retirement? For never? It's obviously quite difficult, or to be honest, it's impossible to save time for later. The illusion to be able to do so is probably one of the most dangerous lies of our modern times. Faced with this insight, I felt an urgent need to do something about it. At the beginning, I didn't really know where to start. But then there came this one day in January 2013 that really changed my perspective. I was working for a recruitment agency in Berlin at that time when a job application popped up on my desktop that I had never seen before. Two people, two highly qualified ladies, applied for one job together. They wanted to share a full-time leading position to have an interesting job on the one hand, but also enough time for their families, friends, and other aspects of their lives. I instantly loved that idea of job sharing for three reasons. First of all, they were a great team. They complemented each other so perfectly that they had much more to offer than one person could ever do. They were willing to represent each other in cases of illness or vacation which meant 100% all year long presence for their future employer and less stress for them. And they were so motivated to manage their job sharing constellation themselves, making it feel like one person for their future boss. For the two women, this was the perfect model to have more time now and not later. For me, the advantages of such, such a job model were so clear that I told the first colleague I met about it. And this, by chance, was Anna, who today is my co-founder and job-sharing partner as well. We decided to promote this fantastic idea of job-sharing and quit our jobs two days later. Eight weeks later, we founded Tandem Employ, which is an online platform helping people and companies with the realization of job-sharing. This was two and a half years ago. Since then, Anna and me, and meanwhile an absolutely great team, have been advancing a more life-friendly and flexible working world. And after sharing and discussing our idea with a lot of people, I can tell you that the reactions are revealing and say a lot about our mindsets, barriers, and dogmas. It really is astonishing how people 
on the one hand, are really, really curious and positive about job sharing, but on the other hand, reluctant to embrace it as a new option to improve their own situation. It's a nice idea, it's a great concept, it's so innovative, but, but, a small yet huge word. You cannot guess how many buts I've heard until now. There are far too many to list them all. So let's have a look at five of them that are symptomatic of our society and of the way we perceive and manage work. Don't job sharers have to communicate a lot? Yeah, and that's great because they have to communicate a lot. Or better said, they have to communicate efficiently. In their overlaps, they have to update each other on a regular basis, and this leads to really transparent, efficient, and also pragmatic way of working. It's actually not a loss of time, but the best way to leave the daily treadmill. Doesn't it cost more money for the employer? Nope. At first sight, social security contributions can be a bit higher in some cases. But on closer inspection, you will see that the higher productivity of part-time employees and the perfect fill-in will actually save you a lot of money. Isn't it confusing for the customers to have two contact persons? Well, it's all about communication again. Just tell them that you are a close team and explain the advantages this brings for them. What if someone leaves the company? Great. Usually, the expertise is gone, leaving a huge gap which will take time to fill. In a tandem, someone is still there and can easily train a new job sharing partner. Who's responsible for failure? Actually, posing this question says it all. Let's save the answer for later. Let me tell you why job sharing works. People can cooperate. They really can. People can work together in teams. They can coordinate themselves and they can manage who does what at which time. They can reflect and they can make informed decisions as long as you give them the freedom to do so. They will probably make mistakes at some points. Who doesn't? They will need a warming up phase of a couple of weeks. They are probably even going to argue with each other one day. They are normal people, no superheroes. But, and this is my but, I have seen that it works in hundreds of cases. I have seen so many job sharers in small companies, in huge companies, in project management roles, in sales teams, in marketing units. I have seen job sharers leading teams of a thousand people while working from two different cities. I've seen job sharers from different generations sharing their knowledge and ideas at eye level. I've seen people sharing their jobs in certain stages of life, and one tandem sharing it for 17 years. I've seen tandems who got promoted together for four times in a row. Finally, I've seen job sharers slowly changing the culture in their department by really living a transparent and appreciative form of close teamwork. I have seen job sharing constellations fail, but to be honest, very few. I've never seen so many happy workers before, so many people loving their way of working, their level of autonomy and flexibility and their inspiring tandem partner. I can see that job sharing works every day. And data, by the way, prove me right. 87% of the job sharers in leading positions say that this working model convinced them to stay with the company. 71% of all tandems applying for a promotion together are successful. And 100% of the companies who have tried job sharing once stick with it. Let me tell you why job sharing has to work. Job sharing has to work because we have to meet so many job-related challenges today. We've got increasing burnout rates, a skills shortage, immense problems to combine family and work to organize care for our elderly. 
We get older than ever before, but still work like in times of the industrialization. As if we didn't know so much better now about good work and productivity. We just have to translate our theoretical knowledge into action and start today. What do you think who the men in grey are? Do you imagine them to look like Wall Street investment bankers? Like managers or politicians? Do you think of teachers, your parents, your colleagues maybe? Do you think of others? The men in grey are sitting in this room. They are sitting next to me, next to you. They have names such as pressure, expectations, or we've always done it this way. We are the men in grey. Every single one of us. We keep this whole system running. Our restless society, our accelerating economy. But unlike in the story of Momo, no one seems to be scared. This ignorance and inaction sometimes drives me crazy, especially as we can all do our tiny little bit and heading to another direction. We can all fight for more life-friendly work, for more flexibility, more esteem and humanity. And we can learn a lot from Momo. Because how does Momo succeed in fighting the men in grey? Momo is a child. She's got time to see what's going on. Momo listens. And she's courageous and open-minded. This is all we have to do. We need to take our time to reflect on our work, our life, our needs and our dreams. We need to listen to what is really important to us. And we need to be brave, take our gray suits off, and start sharing our jobs today. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your time. <laughs>